Alrighty. We as a society have been duped. We've been misled in be into believing that we know how to do our part in the fight against climate change. Climate change is the single biggest existential threat facing America and the world. And we who have been following this difficult topic know that we need to work together to solve this ever growing problem. Well, that's my time. I'm just kidding. Anyway, of course, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So I want you to raise your hand if you have an example of anything you do in your everyday life to reduce your carbon footprint. Yes, Olivia. Taking cold showers, all right, anybody else? Elena, turning out the light in your room, that's good. Yeah, anybody else, anybody else? You in the back, yeah. You're vegetarian, all right. These are all really, really good answers. And you guys, I have some good news and I have some bad news. So just shout out whichever you want, you want to hear first. The bad news? Okay. Well, the bad news is that none of the things that you've just listed affect the progression of climate change whatsoever. But the good news is there are things that you can do that will. And I promise I'm going to tell you what they are, but I want to keep you hanging just a little bit longer while I explain the mega truth bomb that I just dropped on you. To repeat, none of the things that you do in your everyday life have any effect on climate change whatsoever. And the only way they would is if everyone in at least the United States did them. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. Why? Well, according to this mouthful of words that I really don't want to say, only 54% of Americans believe that humans are to blame for climate change, aka the only ones who would even consider that acting against it would be worthwhile. Not to mention, it's extremely classist to assume that everyone has the same access to Beyond Burgers and Teslas. But do any of the things that you've just listed in and of themselves even help? Well, let's take veganism and vegetarianism. According to a study done on the environmental impact of Swedish vegetarians, in our current world, it only reduces your, Im your carbon footprint by about 2%. Why? The rebound effect. As soon as we cut emissions in one place, we just move them right on over to another. Because we're so proud that we don't eat meat, we buy from fast fashion chains or take less public transportation. And on top of that, even buying from sustainable brands warrants a search into their true natures because shaky and vague regulations can lead to not so sustainable protocols that still justify their raised prices. So if none of these so-called sustainable practices do anything, why the hell do we think they do? Well, buckle up and get ready because the story is pretty crazy. In the year 2004, public relations experts Ogilvy and Mather were hired to create an ad campaign designed to alert the public about heat trapping carbon pollution, which is basically when the CO2 in Earth's atmosphere gets trapped, making the sun's heat stay trapped on Earth and making the globe warmer and warmer as time goes on, hence the term global warming. But <laughs> instead of telling the public that the CO2 was being emitted by drilling into the fossilized carbon reserves underneath the ground and then being used as fuel for just about anything it could be, they told them a slightly different story. You see, public relations experts Ogilvy and Mather were hired by a company called BP, as in the second largest non-state owned oil company in the entire world, BP, British Petroleum, as you might know them. Why did one of the biggest fossil fuel emitters in the entire world do this? Well, in the, year, in the years of the 90s and the 80s, environmental scientists had somewhat of a rare breakthrough in communicating to the public the severity of climate change and why it was happening. And, you know, being a stupidly big oil company, when people started to notice and fear climate change, let's just say the execs started to feel the heat. 
Thank you guys for laughing in the back. I appreciate that. But anyway, the oil execs were threatened. And so being the execs of an oil company, they took the easy way out and just blamed somebody else for climate change. And that somebody else was unfortunately us. <laughs> How they did this? They created a phrase that inflicts what I like to call a paper cut of shame just small enough so as not to be noticed, but painful enough to change your mood and change your behavior. What was the phrase, you ask? Carbon footprint. BP's ad campaign was wildly successful, and soon even those who actually wanted to stop climate change started using it, and this legitimized it. It didn't matter if it was based on any science, because it wasn't, because money was flowing and the people were content, or in other words, exactly where the fossil fuel industry wanted them to be. <sighs> so, other, so in other words, not only do carbon footprints not help climate change, they've actually hurt the fight against it. My begging people focus on themselves instead of the coal companies and by extension politicians that were actually to blame for the climate crisis. But if you were looking for a talk on climate nihilism, you are in the wrong auditorium because we're not about that here because the very thing that fossil fuel companies wanted to stop you from doing is the very thing that you all need to do. Vote. Hold for groans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, it's like voting is really hard and it's like, it's, 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 no, there's not always help. And I get it, I get it, I do understand that. But hold on, because the very logic that you were just using to justify why you should do, you know, going, going, turning out the lights off, doing all of those things can be used to say why you need to vote, except you were using them to justify stuff that doesn't matter. We go out of our way to be vegan, turn the lights off at night, take cold showers, take public transportation, because we have some notion that all of these actions are going to add up. But when it comes to voting, something that has been proven to create change, we fall short. But you know, the voting system is flawed and a chance to vote only comes up every so often. So what else can we do? We can create real change. And I don't just mean protesting every few years when a Greta Thunberg quote goes viral. I mean taking steps in your community to create a positive impact. Okay, well that's vague as hell, what does that mean? Let me show you. Excuse me, let me just pull it up. When I was in middle school, I co-founded an organization called Climate Club DC. This was a tiny branch off of our science club and only had about seven or eight kids in it, including me and my co-founder, Abigail Stark. And one day, our school brought in an organization based out of California, one that we would later have the privilege of calling our partners, Mobile Climate Science Labs. And they showed us a presentation about something that really caught our eye, a presentation about light bulbs. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, and because I'm a huge nerd and you can't stop me, incandescent and fluorescent lights majorly suck. This image up here was taken using one of our infrared cameras showing three different light bulbs, incandescent, fluorescent, and LED bulbs. <laughs> What this infrared camera is actually measuring, kind of, is how much heat these bulbs are giving off. And as you can see, <laughs> that incandescent is giving off a lot of heat energy. But, you know, we don't need heat in a light bulb because we're trying to see not roast marshmallows. And despite this quite obvious fact, only 10% of the energy used to power that incandescent light bulb right there goes into actually making it light up. Over 90% of the energy used to power it is being wasted in heat. And fluorescent lights are a bit better, but they still waste a third of their energy in heat. Yikes. <laughs> Luckily, we have our best friend, LEDs, to save us from this treachery. But how are we supposed to get these used everywhere? Well, that's the problem that my organization works to solve. 
Teams of our students conduct energy efficiency surveys around the Washington DC region. We choose buildings which we regard as the most meaningful and promising on a city and national scale. And you know, in Washington DC, there are a lot of those, meaning our projects are reducing both the admissions of our hometown and some of the buildings that have the greatest power in the world. Our team also determines who has responsibility for energy usage in that building, responsibilities for how lighting is maintained and kept up to date. We determine how best to contact those people, how to win them over to want to have discussions with us. And often these employees, often these happen to be employees of federal agencies, given the city we're in, and they're happy to work with us. We have conducted surveys of the White House, the United States Capitol, the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, and the Library of Congress, to name a few. And many of those, we didn't even need to go inside for. My organization has gone from a group of a few committed seventh graders to becoming a year-round elective focused specifically on climate action at my middle school Lowell, the first of its kind in the nation. And our group has not only presented at the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science Convention, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's, or NOAA's, Mid-Atlantic Educators Conference, we have successfully changed the lights at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum from energy wasting fluorescence to energy saving LEDs. But that's not all. We're currently in communications with those at the United States Capitol to change the four lights at the top of the dome or Thales to, to LEDs. To conclude though, you can totally go vegan, shower shorter, or take the bus because you want to, but not because they'll actively help the environment. But don't just write off the impact that you can have, because if two seventh graders can put their heads together and go on to change the lights at one of the most famous museums around the world, I mean, we're talking a setting of a Night at the Museum movie here. Imagine all that you and your unique set of skills can do by just asking yourself a question, What's wrong and how can I fix it? We need to work together. I mean, actually work together because getting rid of the single biggest existential threat facing America and the world was never going to be easy. But maybe, just maybe in doing this, we can live in the brighter, ever so slightly less chaotic world that we all hope for. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk and have a wonderful afternoon.